And welcome to Talking Hawks. You are the best fans in the world. Uh, Chris and I are here tonight uh, with Talking Hawks. How are you going, Chris? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Great e to be back. Excellent, excellent. We've got a special guest tonight, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So um, <laughs> let us know where you're at. Um, fans, we uh, say good day. Tonight we're going to have uh, the uh, the shot clock back. Uh, we've got some great questions we want to throw to uh, Stephen Gillum. He's our special guest tonight, so sit tight. Uh, a premiership uh, favourite. Uh, he was much loved, wasn't he? Very much loved and um, very quiet, but yeah, absolutely loved about his the way he went about his business, and he always got the job done. Yeah, Gilly um, is great value. He's back at the club now, so he's going to tell us a little bit about that. So um, hang around. Throw us your best questions through um, as we go. We, we've got a few things in store, but um, we've done pretty well on the uh, Denver Granger Barras sponsorship as well, haven't we? Certainly have. I think we're about a third of the way there. So, um, yes, we're just looking to keep that momentum going and hopefully reach our goal of uh, $4,000. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell your hawks, everybody you know at work, just get everybody on board to enjoy the uh, journey with us. Awesome. Well, mate, without further ado, um, I think we have Stephen Gillum, uh, Gilly, waiting in the, uh, what are we calling it, Chad? Lobby. Lobby. Here he is. Gilly, how are you going? G'day, boys. I'm going very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's it's, it's a pleasure. our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, it's, mate, it's, uh, it's great to have you. Mate, we want to reminisce a little bit. We want to go back to your playing days and, and you know, maybe not the, the one game at Port, but or your, your Giants times as much, because there's much love for the Hawks here. But uh, Chris, give us a little rundown on Gilly. Well, after a, yeah, a slow start to his career, after being um, playing with Oakley Chargers in the TAC Cup as well, being captain of the under-18 side, which is a pretty big raps, if you ask me. Uh, drafted at number 16 in 2002, national draft. Uh, yeah, so I went to Port Adelaide in 2003, it was pretty tough to get into the side. They, I think they finished top of the ladder both years, playing the, in the dominant uh, Brisbane era. But, yeah, tough team to get into. Before, uh, our friend and coach, Alistair Clarkson, had brought him across and uh, had a nice career at Hawthorne. Um, so here I have some awesome career highlights for a back minute. Career high 26 disposals, career high 15 marks in two separate occasions, career high eight tackles, and my favourite, six hit outs. Do you remember that game, Gilly? I don't. What game was that? That was against Essendon in 2010. Okay. Was, okay. That, Must was have... that the backman rucking in the back, or did you have a little stint in the middle? No, I think I went forward actually, uh, and I must have taken the ruck, ruck work in the Ford Fifty. Um, I think I jagged one of my very few goals that night too on Dustin Fletcher, which was a bit of a highlight as well. One, one of your four career goals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, doing it against uh, uh, Fletcher is, is pretty good. Uh, pretty good raps. He he, did, he went well as a defender. He did well. He was one of my uh, idol like idols and um, guys who I really looked up to uh, coming through when I was uh, at Oakley um, playing key back. Uh, and I remember during my draft year, they a lot of the clubs would ask, you know, who do you look up to? Who do you model your game on? And I'd always say Dustin Fletcher. I thought he was a, a brilliant player. And, um, yeah, it was uh, a bit of a thrill to kick a goal on him that night. Oh, very good. Mate, um, take us back. So how, how did it eventuate that uh, – what was Clarko's role as an assistant back at, at Port Adelaide and how close were you to him at the time? Yeah, so Clarko was an assistant coach, as you mentioned, under Mark Williams. He'd coached in his own right central districts in the SANFL over in Adelaide in the, their local comp. And he came on board at Port Adelaide as, a, as the forwards coach. So I actually didn't um, obviously come under his umbrella – uh, I was with the defenders and Dean Bailey uh, worked with that line uh, and I did a lot of work uh, with the defenders and, and the coaches there. So didn't have a whole heap to do with Clarko, but um, certainly uh, he had his hands full with the with the forwards. But, um, yeah, we obviously crossed paths uh, at Port and glad we did because he ended up uh, getting the job at Hawthorne uh, just 
couple of weeks before uh, Port played off in the grand final in 04 and Choco wouldn't let him sit in the box for that game. I remember that, actually. <laughs> Oh, and, and he was, uh, it was it was an interesting decision by the club rather than uh, going for a few big names. So they've, they've snagged uh, Clarko and look at him now, 17 years, I think it is. So um, was there much of a bond you had with him, would you say, or did it more develop once you came across? Yeah, actually, once Clarko left, um, I stayed at Port uh, for the next year and played a lot of footy at my local club, North Adelaide. And um, probably later on that year, uh, I remember getting a few calls from Clarko, um, checking in on how I was doing um, just personally, but also with my footy at, at the Roosters at North Adelaide. So um, I remember one call uh, was after a game. We, we'd played a, uh, I think it was a, an elimination final um, at... Uh, at uh, what was the old uh, ground they used to play at in Adelaide? Um, forgotten it. Um, at, at Westlake's there. What was it called? There we go, mate. We've got the fans. Just remember this. They're very intelligent, the, the, the fans on the line. Yeah, at Footy Park. Um, and I'd had a really dirty day. I um, Fergus Watts was playing for the opposition side, uh, Woodville West Torrens Eagles. Um, I'd been struggling all year with osteitis pubis and uh injury and, and that sort of thing anyway i played the game and and we lost pretty badly and i'd had a few kicked on me that day and uh i wasn't feeling too good about myself and then clarko rang me and he said oh how'd you go and i said geez i, I hope he's not watching or he doesn't know the results or he's not following it too closely because i said oh yeah mate I, you know I, I did okay we got rolled but you know i was sort of happy with my, how i went just trying to pump my own tires up in case he was interested in in um the upcoming drafts and the preseason and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, still don't know to this day. We haven't spoken about that. He must not have looked at the stats too hard because I, I didn't have it one of my great days. But um, and and then we just stayed in contact from there. I, I got delisted from Port Adelaide. I ended up training at Essendon. Uh, would you believe? Thank God I didn't go there. Um, yeah. In the in the preseason of two thousand and or end of 2005 early 2006 and yeah uh chris pelkin was another guy that was at port adelaide in the recruiting team there he he also moved to hawthorne and uh was lucky enough to get rookie by hawthorne in in the rookie draft in 2006 so i uh spent the first part of pre-season up until christmas at the old glen ferry oval uh and then we moved to waverley uh in the new year uh in 2006 so tell, tell us Briefly, what was the first impressions when you walked in the doors? Uh, so my, my literally my first training session was in the old boxing ring under the Glen Ferry stand. I don't know if you guys remember that or if many fans joining us tonight remember, but um, it they hadn't spent any money on it. It was it was run down. It was almost falling over. Uh, the smell wasn't too great. But uh, Hodgie, Hodgie could certainly handle himself in the boxing ring and I remember walking back to the change rooms with a blood nose and that was my first welcome to Hawthorne. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. You can go into battle with that bloke many years later. How's that? Now, Paul Salmon uh, touched on the rooms and he, I think he enjoyed how the fans would just uh, freely come in every now and then. So I don't know if that was happening when you were there, but uh, uh, it's good. It's good. Mate, we've got the fans uh, asking a few questions. Uh, keep dropping them in, fans. We're going to keep an eye on that. But, um, yeah, Gilly, tell us probably those first few years, just quick snapshot, you know, to get ready for 08. How were you feeling as a player? You know, how long did it take you to get settled? And then, you know, did you think you'd have the success so quickly? Uh, short answer is probably we, we uh, got success earlier than what everyone had planned or thought. Uh, my, I, I played a lot of the 2006 season at Box Hill. Um, it was one of the, the only seasons I, you know, I remember playing every game. And then the, I got the last four games of that year in the senior team. Um, Zach Dawson was, was in my position probably a lot of that year. And I was just biding my time at Box Hill. And we, you know, we didn't have a, an amazing team at Box Hill at the time with the alignment. Um, our depth was pretty thin. So we'd get... We'd get belted, in all honesty, most weeks at Box Hill, and it wasn't a whole heap of fun. But um, kept hanging on to the 
the thought that I was good enough to play at the level and when my opportunity came, I, I would grab it. So um, much like my port debut, I was a late inclusion into the game against uh, Carlton. Uh, I'll never forget uh, being rung by Clarko and saying, mate, um, you're playing tomorrow. This is uh, on a Saturday. I was watching my mates play uh, footy, my old my old school side at Whitefriars, and um, he said, uh, and you're not going to start on the bench. We're going to start you on the ground, and you're going to play in the back pocket, and you're going to be matched up to Anthony Kudafidis. Oh, wow. <laughs> Get ready, son. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no stuffing around. Uh, so... I was absolutely pumped. Um, There's a, a fair bit of nerves as well. Uh, Kuda was at the back end of his career, but still an absolute superstar of the comp. Um, anyway, we, uh, we we did okay. We won that game um, and we won, won the last four on the trot in 06 uh, and really springboarded um, into 07. Uh, I remember playing in Johnny Barker's last game at, at Eddie Had as it was back then or Telstra Dome or whatever it was called and... Uh, we actually won really convincingly against the Cats uh, the last game of 06 and we had a, a sense of belief going into that pre-season in 07 and we had a really, really strong year, um, all culminating in that famous victory against uh, Adelaide, uh, again, back at back at Etihad, or Marvel as it's known now, uh, when Buddy turned it on, kick seven, kick one right really late in the game. Uh, to win us the game, basically. And um, then we never came down off cloud nine uh, in time to back it up against the Kangaroos the week later. I think I got mark of the year taken on me by Aaron Edwards that night. He still lets me know about it. Um, I, I, I reckon I was lucky that... Yeah, I reckon I was lucky that the finals aren't included in mark and goal of the year back then. Otherwise, it, it would have won mark of the year for sure. It's actually over Crody and I was trying to spoil Crody, Crody wasn't too happy with me that night. Um, so anyway, we, we learned a lot of lessons um, through that final series and um, I think really strengthened and galvanised us to understand what it, it took to have a really strong season but then a really strong finals campaign and then uh, we springboarded again into 2008. We got better again. Um, we had more experience playing together. and. Um- who was it? Adrian said, thank God you didn't go to us. And then Scotty's uh, chimed in. You would have had September's off at least, mate. So uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, Scott. Um, <laughs> Christian says yeah, that there might be a little bit of a, a rumour about you uh, winning tats. It's a cracker. So I don't know if that's worth touching on, Gilly. You can uh, keep that one under your hat for now, maybe. But uh, is that worth Unfortunately, it? Unfortunately, I can put that to bed. That there's one of my mates, Hamish McLaughlin, went live with that on Channel Seven on one of his shows. Um, yeah, it was a good rumor uh, going around the, the circles. I was still playing ammo footy uh, when that rumor was floating around, and I'd get heckled over the boundary. What are you playing here for? You know, go off retire with your millions. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not true. I think uh, you know. I, I don't know where it started or where it came from, but. Um, Unfortunately, not true. Mm. Give us a quick rundown. Um, just who were you closest with um, at the club? Uh, so Crody, Crody was like my big brother. Uh, so obviously around the club during the week, but also uh, out on the ground on the weekend, he really sort of looked after me. I remember a night up at the Gabba and my job was to sit in front of Jonathan Brown. And uh, who gave you that job? Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was you know one, you know one of the one of the coaches came up with the strategy strategy of if we we're going to win the game we had to stop Brownie. So Crady was going to play on him, but I was going to fill fill the hole if I could and drop off my opponent and try and get in front of him. So he said, "Mate, if you keep doing that all night, I'm I'm going to cave your head in." Um, and then. And, uh, yeah, in that big, tough voice that he's got. And uh, <laughs> and not he hadn't even finished saying what he was going to say and Crody's just absolutely smashed him in the back. And he said, no, you're not, and made me feel 10 foot tall. So Crody was, was amazing on and off the field. Um, we, we had a really strong bond with the defenders. The back six is sort of always spoken about team within a team. So um, guys like Brent Guerra, Hodgie, 
Crody, obviously, Rick Ladson, um, and those guys who played in the in the back six more often than not in those days. Uh, we became really close. Uh, even guys that, that didn't play as much, Tom Murphy, um, and then Brad Sewell, Clinton Young, uh, Michael Osborne, uh, Grant Birchall was another one in, in at halfback. Um, so, yeah, there was, there, you know, I, I think at, at any footy club really, um, same as same as school or or your workplace, wherever you work, you click, you know, naturally with five or six people and you, you become really, really close and tight. And then um, just naturally being a footy club, you, you're all so close and spending so much time together that you do become really close for the time that you're there. And then, you know, everyone mo- goes on their separate ways and you, and you do your best to keep in touch. We've got a uh, Campbell Brown set up a, a WhatsApp group with the 2008 Premiership side, which is great, which is pretty funny at times. Uh, some uh, some interesting and funny character, isn't he? Yeah, Brownie Brownie's another one. Brownie's another one that I was close with and and still close with now. Um, and he's been a real driver of that. You know, he's since our reunion a couple of years ago, our ten re- reunion. We we now catch up twice a year, which is fantastic. Um, oh, cool. And cool. you know, one of the best bits about playing footy and, and winning premierships is uh, that you know you're always sort of joined and bonded for the rest of your life. Yeah, they're having that chemistry and yeah, with those players. It's um, it seems like every Premiership team has that bond, so it's, it's something you can't just make happen. Such a highlight that you just have such fond memories of, and you just always love reminiscing with those guys of, about that day and and that time in your life. Yep. Let's throw to uh, to Adrian here, um, Gilly. What were your first thoughts upon seeing Cyril Rioli? So at, at training, so oh eight, he's coming. That was his debut year, and um, yeah. done phenomenally, phenomenally well. Can't even quite get it out. I'm that excited about Cyril. And then, um, but yeah, training. What did you think? Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Um, mate, he, he's just a very special player. We, when the draftees come in, usually they have a, a sizzle reel of all their highlights from their junior career, and. Yeah, Cyril's Cyril's junior career would match any anyone's highlights reel ever. Um, so I was just so lucky to play with two absolute superstars and freaks uh, in Buddy and Cyril. Um, so that terrorised us at, at training, and we'd look at each other and go, "Thank God we don't have to play on them um, when we played." So I'd match up on Buddy, um, one of the small defenders. that have you know Brent Guerra or or Lado or Birch would try and look after Cyril during match play during training. And um, if we, you know, if we were able to do not a bad job, that gave us real confidence going into the game that we'd be able to handle most other <laughs> forwards because they, they weren't as good. So um, he, he was good straight off the bat. Like, he, you know, an 18 year old kid, um, he'd slot into drills and wouldn't look out of place right from the start. So um, he uh, he did stuff during games like you'd, you'd feel like you were spectating out on the ground. You'd just sort of shake your head and get around the other defenders and almost start clapping um, some of the highlights and stuff he did. So um, he's, th- those two guys, without doubt, are, are the best players that I've ever seen or, or played with. So just quickly while we're talking about Cyril, um, we've heard uh, pretty strong rumours about Tyler Brockman that he's got some similarities with his highlight uh, package. So can you elaborate on that? Have you seen him at training at all? I uh, Now I'm on the other side. I'm not in the footy department anymore. I'm in, uh, I'm in the commercial team in the uh, administration. So looking after corporate sales. So not a whole heap of time to sit in the theatre and watch uh, highlights of, of new draftees, unfortunately. But it, it does sound pretty good. I think Mitch was... Sammy Mitchell um, was quoted as, you know, saying that after his career is done, his highlights table will match anyone going around, which obviously uh, Mitch was an unbelievable player himself and has got a pretty good handle on uh, all the Hawthorne talent. So for him to say that um, is is pretty big raps and and brings with it a fair bit of pressure for Tyler now. Um, But uh, I've, I've seen him on the track and I've seen glimpses of it glimpses of him it'll be exciting to see if he gets a crack on Saturday against North uh he definitely showed a few things uh if anyone was watching the trial match against the doggies 
last week. Uh, I, uh, I saw bits and pieces and you could definitely see that he's definitely got tricks in his bag. Um, hopefully he, he brings them out uh, this year. I'm so looking we'll, forward to it. Um, we were talking before the show. So Gilly's got, uh, he, he's had a little bit of a check-in and, and about some of these newbies that have come into the club. So fans, if you've got any questions about any of the, the, the new players, uh, Tom Phillips or, or these uh, new draft A's, drop them in. Um, you've got two potential stories for us, Gilly. Uh, I, I think you mentioned one. Fans, we, we want you to vote for this tonight and, and Gilly's going to sort of close us out with, with uh, this story. So one was... When buddies kicked, what was it? 13. Tassie? Tassie. Tassie. 13. There we go. 13. 13. That's it. Thank you, Hutto. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was a little bit of uh, Clarko and uh, a little bit of bickering going on behind the scenes. Is that right? There, there was. So, unfortunately, that game, I flew down to Tassie to be emergency, which meant, meant I sat you. in the... Too much. No, no, no. So, we want to vote on this, Gilly. So, oh, sorry. This one. that's all right. Sorry. So, the, the stage is set. Clarko arguing. Who was he arguing with? Chris Fagan. Fags in the background. And then Bud's come and turned it on. Or your other possible story, Gilly. I've, I've forgotten off the top of my head. What was it? It's another Clarko story in the box. Oh, you were in the box the day that Clarko and the wall didn't have the best of friendships. So, um, if you want to... A, a play perspective from someone who knows the man and, and knows knows Bud. You know, let us know. Uh, give us a heart if you want to hear the uh, the Buddy Thirteen goals and uh, that story, or if you give us a thumbs up if you want uh, the the Clarko box incident. Uh, <laughs> so, what have you got there, Chris? I was just going to touch on. You just talked about um, a little bit about Sammy and his perspective on uh, Tyler Brockman. But uh, he's now coach at Box Hill, um, and you've spent a bit of time at Box Hill in the last few years. What, um, where do you see, especially after um, the 2020 COVID season that knocked out the, the VFL, how do you see this coming season and the, the players and the changes that have happened at the uh, Box Hill Hawks? Yeah, it's, it was really unfortunate last year. So I was um, I came back to the club in uh, the general manager at Box Hill capacity last year and uh, we were gearing up this time last year for the season and then it got postponed and we came out of lockdown one and uh, we were gearing up again and, um, you know, going into lockdown two basically just cancelled the season. So it was really disappointing for Box Hill yeah. and all the players Um Obviously, we, we didn't get to see many of the young guys uh, on the Hawthorne list play last year because there was no reserves games and things like that. So uh, I think Box Hill are incredibly well placed uh, going into this new VFL season, uh, a, a totally new competition with 21 teams. So yeah. we've got all the teams in Victoria and the standalones and aligned clubs as well as the teams from New South Wales and Queensland. And, you know, a lot of the changes last year and reduction in soft cap meant that um, clubs resourcing their football department had to cut a lot of the resourcing and coaching and development you know, with their reserves. Whereas I think Hawthorne and Box, the Box Hill alignment has allowed Hawthorne and Box Hill to be in a position of strength where you've got Sam Mitchell, head coach, head of development, um, with all of the guys that will play regular football down at Box Hill um, and then yep. getting the the development and coaching at Hawthorne Monday to Friday during the week. So I think they're incredibly well placed. They've, they've got a really strong list in their own right, Box Hill. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you might see a couple of the guys training with Hawthorne at the moment from the Box Hill list added to the Hawthorne list with a couple of the spots we've got available at the moment. Um, and... I, I think they'll do incredibly well. I think Sam, um, with the help of Andy Collins coming back to the club in an, a senior assistant role, will really help Sam and his development. And I think, obviously, um, Sam's ambition in time is to be a senior coach at the AFL level in his own right. And so this is the start of that journey, I guess. He's done a year at West Coast where he that, you know, was part of a coaching group that won the grand final uh, he's had a couple of years yep. now under under Clarko and and the, with the other coaches, 
Uh, I think the appointment of Craig McRae will really add to the coaching group at uh, at Hawthorne this year. I think from uh, just the, the limited amount of time he's been at the footy club, um, people are speaking really, really highly of what he's bringing and, and the calibre of person and character he is. Uh, so that's really exciting, and um, yeah. I think yeah, the, the club and the development is uh, is incredibly well placed. And um, if you if you're a draftee or in the, the first one to three years of your career, I don't think you'd be in a better place than than at Hawthorne. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Comes from another club rather than them poaching our uh, yeah. coaches, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Love it. All right. Well, we might uh, move on. Fans, keep those questions coming. We we're going to touch a little bit more on the 08 but, uh, with Gilly shortly. But uh, let's just throw the shot clock. Um, so, Gilly, just first thing that comes to mind, a uh, couple of minutes, we will uh, put you in the hot seat. Um, we love we love your honesty so far. So, all right. So, Stephen Gillum, uh, who was the best player you played with? Going to have to say Cyril. When you played, who was your bunny? Who did you really dominate? I actually dominated Fev. Ooh, love nice. that. Were you, were you, <laughs> were you on him uh, the night that uh, Clarko just uh, smashed him with all the defenders so he couldn't kick a ton? Yeah. 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 Love, love this. Sorry, <laughs> Shad, who said media, he's in the background. He's, he's really not enjoying this. Um, so in your playing days, um, who was the biggest influence of uh, former players that uh, came back to the – Hawthorne. Sorry, but, oh, the influence in former, on me. In your playing days, which former Hawthorne player perhaps had, had a big impact around the club? Uh, so I think well, Jason Dunster was the director of footy at, at, during my time, so I'd have to probably say Jace. Perfect. Yep. Your first word that comes to mind when I mention Clarkson, one word. Angry. Yeah. Sam Mitchell. <laughs> Class. Campbell Brown. Tough. Luke Hodge. Warrior. All right, let's just throw in Aussie. How about Aussie? Joker. There we go. <laughs> Who was the funniest hawk uh, in your playing days? Definitely Aussie, full of pranks there all the time. I didn't know I was going to lead into that. That was a bit of a fluke. Um, so you go into a, into a grand final. Who do you want to follow as captain? Crawford, Mitchell, or Hodgie? Hodge. Uh, who were your mentors at the uh, at the club? Uh, so definitely Crody. Yep. Uh, I'd have to say Brad Sewell as well. Uh, my defensive coach was Ross Smith at the time. Uh, Clarko obviously um, took an interest in me from back all, all the way back to Port days, um, and then a couple of the other the staff and admin staff. We had Jason Bird, who was our play development and welfare officer, uh, who I got along well with and, and really took an interest in me and helped me a fair bit off the field. So Beautiful. definitely appreciate it. For- very good. Uh, who would you say is the smartest AFL coach that you played under? Uh, well, I had Mark Williams, Clarko, and Leon Cameron, and Sheeds there for for a bit. Sheeds is yeah. pretty crazy as a giant, so I'd actually probably say Sheeds. Love it. Um, your biggest influence uh, in your life post football. Who or what because- is it? Um, uh, I'd probably have to, have to say when, once I finished playing at the Giants, I moved back to uh, Victoria and Melbourne and went and played at St Kevin's Old Boys Footy Club and um, a guy by the name of John Paul Whitbread and, and one of my best mates now, Anthony Lynch, who was the captain at St Kevin's, uh, probably been the biggest influence on my life post-footy. Um, and then finally, uh, if Clarko was a car, what model of car would he be? <laughs> uh, he'd be, he'd be like an old, um, beat up Ute, I reckon. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> 
I heard he uh, re- he got uh, some of the players down to do some work on his farm. Um, is that because they couldn't go to Kokoda because of the travel? He, he gave them a bit of a, an opportunity to do uh, a, an outdoor bonding experience. Is that is that how that went? Yeah, I, I think he'll take anyone to work on his farm. I think he's pretty keen to. I think he's got a, a fair bit to do, and he's in a rush to get it done. So, um, anyone out there that wants to give him a hand, let me know, and uh, we can tee that up. All right. Put- Drop it in the comments, uh, Clarko. I'm, I'm, uh, I bumped into him uh, over the uh, off season, having a little hike down down that way. So yeah, that was that was lovely. Him and Mrs. Clarkson having a bit of a stroll and, and, and hike. But thank you, mate. Uh, very good, very good. So, oh wait, let me just go back to the fans' questions here. What have we got? Um, someone commented around um, Taylor was a bit stiff around that era as far as uh, not getting perhaps the opportunity and. There's a bit of injury yeah. from memory. Brent, Brent Renouf got in. Yeah, we touched on that um, pre-show. Um, what, what, who do you think should have had that spot personally? Do you think Tails should have got it or Renouf? So, yeah, we, we were talking about it. Um, thanks, Lee, uh, about a pre-show. So there was actually three of us that had played most of the year in 2008 but got dropped right on the eve of the elimination final. Uh, sorry, the qualifying final against the Bulldogs. And uh, it was uh, on a Thursday that Tails, myself and Xavier Ellis got pulled into um, what we used to call the little fishbowl at Waverley. So there was this little room um, on level one at, at Waverley and it was basically um, fully um, surrounded in windows. And so everyone could see what was going on there all the time. So we used to call it the fishbowl and we got called in there and um, – he basically said, boys, I'm really, really sorry um, and I know you're going to be disappointed and angry and hurt, but um, you're not going to play on Friday night. Um, we've, you know, picked the team that we think is going to give us the best chance to win and um, this was just before training, our last training session before the game and he said, as disappointed as you are, you're going to have to be really over the top excited and enthusiastic for this training session because the boys are really excited to, to go into this final. So wow. within two minutes, um, you've got to pick yourself up and um, swallow your pride and just be up and about for the boys um, for that training session. Um, to make things worse from my on my behalf was that they were going to pick me, but... Um, but I was going to be a late omission 40 minutes before the game so the Bulldogs couldn't predict that change and, and change their matchup. So I couldn't tell any of my family or or anyone. Um, and so I had to pack my bag like I was playing. I, I rocked up to the game and then just before the team sheets were announced, I, I, I was out. And um, that was the first time all my family who were sitting in the stands knew that I, I wouldn't be playing. And... Um, and then, yeah, I was telling you boys before what, what that next two or three weeks was like for me. It was it was absolute agony because um, I remember the boys being on fire, Buddy kicking seven or eight on Brian Lake and um, them winning easily on a Friday night. We rocked up on Saturday. Uh, Tails, myself and Xavier had to do a running session because we hadn't played. Um, that was horrific. And then... Um, waiting around a week, you know, so so you have the next week off and you go straight into a prelim. We're all thinking, well, unless there's something catastrophic happens, we're not going to get another chance. Um, that night, Cam Stokes did his, did his hammy. So Xavier knew that he was going to most likely be in for his spot. Uh, and then it was dependent on the results from that weekend, how the selection would fall. Um, we ended up playing St Kilda um, in the prelim final. Um, I got called on the Wednesday, I think was our day off, by Clarko and said, mate, can you meet me at Hodges in half an hour? Uh, so I went there. We sat down. He said, mate, um, you're back in the team and you're playing on Nick Rewalt. And I was over the moon, absolutely over the moon. Shattered for Murph, one of my really good mates who I knew was going to be dropped and um, not play. Uh, we beat St Kilda really, really well um, and on the Friday night again. And then Saturday I'm watching the Bulldogs play Geelong in the other preliminary final to go into the grand final. I knew that we were in there. It was just a matter of who we played. And 
I, I don't know if you guys you remember, you probably don't. I remember it vividly because I was riding every single bump on the couch at home, hoping that Geelong would win so it would mean that I would have a match-up and play in the grand final, even though they'd only lost one game all year and would be heavy favourite to win the, the grand final. Um, anyway, they, they end up winning by under two goals, I'm pretty sure, and I was stressed out of my mind. And... Um, I was just so relieved. I actually grew up as a Geelong supporter, pretty passionate um, and one-eyed. My dad and my brother still are mad Geelong supporters. Um, and then, yeah, it was just the best week of my life. Um, the the training, um, I said to you guys before, um, before the parade on Friday, I actually had to go and get a scan because I had a sore foot after our main open training session that we had probably what felt like 10,000 people at Waverley watching um i remember seeing my mom on the friday before the parade and she said you'd i'd never looked happier in my life um and we, we were the underdogs right we were just told to mm. soak it all in really enjoy it embrace the moment um and i think all hawk supporters did as well because it had been a long time you know in yeah. you know a, a club at that time that was so used to success on 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 frequent occasions um, I just remember it being the best week of all time in Melbourne. The weather was perfect um, and then got up and, and we really believed after that round 17 game that we'd got so close and if Hodgie hadn't turned it over late in that game, we might have won that game, that we could really challenge them and win. There, there, there's never been a game that I've played in the brown and gold where I thought we weren't going to win, such as um, Clarko's ability to motivate and inspire um, his group of players. So we, we went out there fully expecting to win if if we played as good as we possibly could. Um, and uh, and we, we were under the pump, absolutely. And, um, you know, if Geelong had taken a few opportunities that they probably should have taken, then it might have been a different story. But um, lucky, lucky for us, we did. We had Stewie Jew, the secret weapon, unleashed it late in the third quarter and um, we hung on. So... Um, yeah, just just very very good memories of uh, of that love, time. Uh, love, hearts. love, lots of love hearts reaction to that one, mate. Uh, Stewie Jerry turned it on. So minutes. we we did have a question about um, your very good uh, mate Crody. Were you aware that he'd broken his foot when he was limping off the ground, or did you think he was p potentially coming back on? Uh, I didn't know exactly what he'd done. I knew Browning and Crody were carrying injuries going into that game, so that they. Uh, had what you'd call stress fractures in their foot and they'd had pain-killing injections to play the game. And I, w I would say that more than 50% of the players, both Hawthorne and Geelong, would have been playing under pretty heavy painkillers. Um, you get to the end of the season, especially a final series, and you're, and you're not in a good way. Your body's just hanging on for dear life. Um, but the, the, the moment and the adrenaline that's running through you during finals and especially a grand final just gets you across the line. Um, we knew Crody was pretty serious by the way he went down and how he went off. Um, so, yeah, straight away we had to recalibrate and change our matchups and Brownie ended up coming back for the second half and, um, and uh, yeah, but we were, we were certainly under the pump. And then to make matters worse, probably, you know, one of the leaders for the Norm Smith medal at halftime, Youngie goes down with his ankle early in the third quarter as well. And your scan, was that just a provisional scan or was that something serious leading into that? No, nah, I, I, it was just precautionary. I knew probably in my heart of hearts that I, was, I would be fine. Uh, a lot of my teammates were saying don't get a scan because even if they show the slightest little thing, you know, the physios and doctors will be all over you. So um, anyway, no, I, I, I knew it would be all good and I just probably just had to go and do it to, to make sure that 100% I was all good to go. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, let's uh, skip forward to the now. Uh, just conscious of the time, mate, it's, it's been great hearing some of those stories. Could you give us uh, just a bit of a taste tester on or just what you're seeing with these this young crop and, and uh, Tom Phillips as well? Who, who's who's standing out for you and what are you seeing? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, look, we've we've got a really exciting group. I think first and foremost, they're all great people, and I think they'll really add to the culture of Hawthorne and the playing group. 
Um, but I think um, DGB, as he's known, Denver, um, is uh, a really confident kid, really highly touted, um, tall defender. I think he's going to only develop and mature as he, as he goes. I think he's pretty light and raw at the moment, but um, from all reports on the track, it's uh, he's showing some really great signs and, and really encouraging things. He he wants to learn, and I think uh, Sis has taken him under his wing and, and wants to uh, fast track that development and learning as, as much as he possibly can out on the track at the moment. So um, that's been a really great part of Sis's development where he knows he won't be able to play, unfortunately, a lot of this year, but um, he'll be able to help those young guys in other ways. We've already mentioned Tyler Brockman. He looks really exciting as that small pressure forward um, who will have some great highlights, no doubt, and be really exciting to watch this year. Connor Downey looks ready to go, looks really mature. A um, couple of the things and pieces of play he was involved in against the Bulldogs last week look, look really good. He looks really calm and composed at the level. His body's mature, so hopefully he can come in and play a role. Really neat left foot kick. Great runner. Um, Where do we'll you see him on a plane if he gets a spot in the side? Do you see him on a wing or somewhere else? Yeah, I, I think he'll either play sort of between the arcs um, in modern footy. So that could be anywhere from half forward, wing, half back, um, just depending on on who we're playing in our game style and, and how that matches up. Um, with the 75 cap of rotations, I think you're going to find a lot of players who have – big tanks and aerobic capacity to stay on the, out on the ground longer will probably rotate through those positions. So I think Connor will play a role there. Um, and, yeah, Tom Phillips, again, similar sort of mould. Left footer, can run all day, will really suit the modern game uh, and really suit the Hawthorne style as well and, and give us a little bit of experience and, and hardness and toughness around the middle of the ground there. So um, all those guys are, are really looking good at the moment. Do you want to touch on the other kids or should I uh, ask you about Will Day? Is Will Day a chance to push up onto the wing or is he going to stay in the back line? Yeah, well, Will's another one. Um, so I think we'd like two or three Will Days. We'd like one at half back, one on the wing and, and one at half forward probably. But um, So leave that up to the coaches who who wants to push their case for where he want, which line he starts in. But, a, again, same sort of thing. Um, an amazing season, first year last year. I think he played 11 or, or 12 games. Um, so he'll only build on that. And, again, he, he looked really good in that game last week and has been training well. And, again, he'll only be better for the experience of last year. It's going to be really exciting, you know, to see some of these guys live in the flesh uh, because they, they haven't had the opportunity to play live in front of their home, home crowd before. So they're, they're going to be really excited. Yeah, yeah, love it, mate. Let me in, indulge for a second here. So we're going to uh, you're you're giving us a hand uh, with this, Gilly. So we, if you haven't seen much of Denver Granger Barras, get onto talkinghawks.com. Have a look at the young fella. We're excited. We're sponsoring him. Uh, we've got uh, our donations through the page, through a legit um, uh, mob called uh, My Cause. So we've raised, as Chris said at the top of the show, uh, we're we're a third of the way there. We're going to sponsor Denver and uh, some of the details are here and we're hoping we'll, we'll land on another. Yeah, maybe Downey. Um, we're getting looked after by, by Gilly and the club. So um, get on board. Uh, here's the details if you want to hear all about uh, what we're doing. And, and like Clarko, just don't get caught napping. Um, <laughs> get on this. There's about room for 30 more people to join us based on the uh, the size and and of the donations. And if you can jump on, you get an opportunity for a few exclusive um, uh, Talking Hawks opportunities, things with the club, things with uh, hopefully Denver uh, along the way and a chance to win a few things. So um, the details uh, will be on that website. Check it out. Um, so thanks for your help there, Gilly. We're excited uh, with the with the prospect of all these youngsters coming through. And, mate, we might just throw to uh, you. Tell us now what you're doing at the club. You've got a few exciting things. And Brad couldn't be here tonight, but uh, Brad and I are going to be uh, with you shortly, Gilly, and, and might bump into Jeff. Yeah, you are, uh, Matt. So thank you. I um, Yeah, so earlier this year, I uh, started as the corporate sales manager at back at Hawthorne in the commercial team. So looking after 
uh, all of our assets across match day and functions and the events the club run uh, in Melbourne and also in Tassie. So uh, my details are on the screen there. Um, give me a ring, um, hit me up on the email or get on our corporate hospitality website um, there and uh, register your interest and I'd be more than happy to have a chat. Um, and obviously we know that this year with reduced capacities and things, it, it might be hard at times to get to the footy. So um, we're really keen as a club to have as many people there as we can. So um, one way to do that is to jump into a, a match day function either in Melbourne or down in Tassie for our home games. Um, the event you mentioned, Matt, is coming up, our Hawthorne in Business first luncheon for the year. So 17th of March, um, we'll uh, have about 300 people in the room. Um, that's our sort of business networking uh, event series that we do. Uh, so we've got a, an awesome panel, obviously, Jeff and Gil uh, doing a and a about uh, the challenges of last year um, and a bit of a review about last year and then a preview of what we can expect um, in 2021. And uh, that promises to be pretty uh, pretty controversial after um, what's been happening, especially in the AFL circles with Hawthorne, with what's going on in Tasmania at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, be in the room live to, to get, the, get it from the horse's mouth about what's happening at the Hawks and what's happening at the AFL and, and what we can expect to, uh, to see uh, in 2021 and, and uh, what's going forward. Well, Gilly's been great looking after us. So uh, if you want to get down there, um, catch Brad and I. Um, I'm sure, Gilly, you'll be rubbing shoulders with everyone down there. Um, the club does need some help at the moment. If you're not a member, if you can afford that, please get on board. Um, we just want to support the club. And, and you know, if, if you're in a position, joining us to sponsor Denver as well. But these sorts of things, um, it does mean a lot to the club when we can get behind them. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's great having someone like you back, Gilly, into the fold doing uh, – doing the brand doing doing the club um, proud yeah thanks boys and thanks for your support as well and i, and I guess just the fans out there that are the listening live now or who will watch it um in the future just my thanks and on behalf of the club as well i know uh, we're pretty proud as a club that everyone stuck behind us last year um we had less than 100 members um not renew um and we had other members that pitched in that we're in an, uh, in a position to help out. So um, everyone was signed up last year. We didn't lose anyone. We stayed connected with everyone and uh, everyone's back on board this year, which is an incredible position really given all of the challenges for the club and uh, the competition and everyone personally last year. So thanks very much for your support and jump on board, which is what, what is going to be a very exciting journey this year. Awesome. Mate, well, um, one last question, if we can indulge, and then a, a story from you, if we can. So, uh, Scotty Williams, is there any players in the current squad you feel would have slotted in or straight into the uh, 08 team? Uh, yeah, there, I think there's a few, like um, guys who, who we know um, and are established um, who, unfortunately, you know, Jack Gunston um, would have snuck in there, I reckon, a guy like Lukey Bruce. Um, you know, would have been pushing up, um, staking his claim to be in there. Uh, but apart from that, like, we, you know, we, you look look back, we, we did have a fairly um, talented, mature team back then. And um, that's, what's win that's what wins, wins your premierships and that's what we're building again at the moment. So um, I'm, I'm really wrapped that you guys are, are getting behind a, uh, a key defender. They're not the, the sexiest guys traditionally running around in the team. You know, usually that's the midfielders or or the forwards, the guys who, who get all the glory. glory but um, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some, quite a bit of love on on the on the comments, Gilly. So yeah, we we noticed. You know, they might not get in all the highlights, but mate, it's it's it all starts from the back line, doesn't it, mate? It does. It does. Defence wins the premierships. That's what they say. That's yep. it. That's it. Um, all right. So we, we've going to throw it back to you one last time. Take it home for us, Gilly. So um, Fagan Clarkson, tell us what was happening, Buddy, uh, on that uh, infamous day when Buddy ripped, ripped them to shreds. 
He did. In the end, he did. But early on, uh, so as I was saying before, uh, we played North Melbourne down in Tassie, uh, and it would have been about halfway through the year. And for whatever reason, uh, Hawthorne and North games are always pretty hotly contested and always pretty close. Uh, North tend to match up pretty well and play well against Hawthorne. So, um, and and Clarko used to play there, you know. Um, so there's that connection as well. So I think he's a bit more fired up for those games than a few of the others potentially because of that reason. But uh, I was in the box. I was emergency. I'd fly down to Tassie. I'd missed my cousin's wedding for it and didn't end up playing. So I was pretty pissed off as it was. As, as, as it was. Um, anyway, I, I was sitting in the back row of the box and I had Clarko and Fags in front of me. And um, the game started, it's in the first quarter, a bit of an arm wrestle. We weren't playing amazing. Uh, I think we'd, we'd got behind two or three goals. And and Fags's role really in the box was to keep Clarko calm and his head in the game. He can get quite fiery um, towards the umpires or players or opposition or whatever it might be. And um, there was a couple of instances where Clarko was getting a little bit carried away and Fags had told him to calm down and, just focus on what he could control and the, the strategy that and the game plan that we went in with. And so it's getting a little bit heated and you can feel it in the box. Like I'd, I'd been in the box a little bit prior to that. And um, so it's gone a bit quiet. The, the assistant coaches aren't talking much. They can sort of feel the tension brewing between uh, Clarko and Fags and... Anyway, a bit of play happened. They might have kicked the goal and he's gone. he's gone off. He's gone off. Where, where are you sitting in the box? Are you are you in the back corner at this point? What, what's Mate, I'm sitting right behind them, them. So I'm in the back, and they're in the in the row in front of me. I can I can feel the rage building up in Clarko. I can feel him radiating heat, and <laughs> Clark Fags is doing his best to calm him down, but it's not just not working. And and the game's sort of slipping away, and we're, we're not going well. So Fags. Gives him his best, mate. Just calm down. Calm down. You're not helping us. <laughs> and with that, Clarko just turns to him and said, Mate, if you say that to me one more time, I'm going to cave your head in. <laughs> I'm going to th- I'm going to throw you out of the box. And uh and Fags just sort of didn't know what to say. Just was like, radio, mate. You know, you've you've lost the pot. And um, anyway, um, we, we sort of it calmed down a little bit after that. And uh, Buddy did what he did, and we ended up winning really easy. And we sort of all laughed about it afterwards. But um, yeah, it got quite heated there for a bit. Were you going? Were you going down to the quarter time huddles? Were you? Did you see how Clarko went from box mode into you know trying to convey that and, and get the players up and about? He, he can flick the switch pretty quick, yeah, over the journey. We've all seen it. We've all seen him go off and then he sort of regains his composure pretty quick. And, um, he does pretty well. Yeah, I, could, I, could, doesn't he? I could I could be here all night telling Clarko stories like that. But, um, I better not. I better not. I'm back at the club now and I, I've got to see him tomorrow. So um, I'll leave it there. But, um, no, I, I, obviously. talking hawks. Thank you, Gil. I, I will. I will. I will. I'll, uh, yeah, no, massive respect for Clark. I, I actually owe him a lot personally um, and professionally for my career, obviously, what his uh, his part in getting me to the Hawks and what he's done for the club since has just been amazing and, and had a massive influence on me, but a lot of my teammates and, and the boys at the club now. So, um, yeah, very, very grateful for, for him. Where is your uh, premiership medallion? Your prize and joy. Where where is that located at the moment? It's in a safe at Mum and Dad's house. Oh, beautiful. I'm just just this comment by Scotty is just timely, Chris. It's, it's, I, I I don't know. We, we haven't gone for the speed dating feel here, Scotty. But you know, this Chris is getting a bit intimate here. So anyway, um, we, we're we're going to break it up here now. Talking Hawks fans, thank you very much for joining us. If you can get behind any of uh, you know Gilly stuff, um, please. You know, it, his details, we'll, we'll drop them, um, you know, one last time. Um, get in touch through the season. There's lots on. Uh, we'll try and get to a few things. And if you can get behind DGB with us, and uh, hopefully we can get enough money up to get behind maybe uh, maybe Brockman or 
or Downey. So uh, let us know if you want to be involved. And uh, thanks for joining us so much tonight. Gilly, thank you. Cheers, mate. Great chat. Love that, boys. Love what you're doing. Keep it going. Keep it, um, you know, passionate and positive. And, uh, yeah, keep supporting the club. And it'll be a, a really exciting, fun journey this year for sure. Awesome, mate. All right. See you later, everyone.